Shashia, the one is the third and last night of the festival of the year. This is our first year in Jesse Cohen, and we are very proud to be part yes, of this uh, establishment for the Digital Arts Center of Iran. You are part of Max, Uli Lanz Max, hello Uli, and Max is a fabrication lab, Mabagat Leitsu, well, basically the community here runs a lot of workshops. I think you're about, you're in for a treat. Uh, this is a lot of promises. This is constant love. Oh, oh, oh. And, oh, yeah. and, <laughs> <laughs> and in the next hour, uh, they're going to talk with us um, about art and bots and manipulation and hacking and all these sort of uh, interesting things. And hopefully it will be more, even more interesting than other things going on. So you will stay with us before our people will join. Um, and with no further ado, I give it up to Daniel to open the session. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. hi, hello, good evening. Um, do you hear me? Do you hear me? No, no, you definitely hear me. Second. Okay, this is fine. Um, so, um, I'm Danielle, I'm an artist, I live here in Israel, in Tel Aviv. Uh, Constant is a conceptual internet artist who is from Holland. He lives now between uh, Holland and uh, Berlin. Um, and it's the first time I ever um, speak in front of an audience in English, and I will do it briefly. Afterwards, uh, Constant will uh, show his work. I will present part of his work, and then we will have a Q&A session. So, um, so within this practice, he reflects uh, on the broad cultural and social effects of communication and image processing technologies, while critically engaging the interface of mega corporations. He examines the boundaries of manipulating Google, Facebook, and Instagram. Um, he has graduated from the Ritual Academy in Amsterdam and has stayed in the Rijks Academy residency. Not once, his artistic friends has got some media coverage. His work was exhibited in numerous institutions around the world, such as the MCA in Chicago, Whitechapel Gallery in London, Schirm Prince Halle in Frankfurt, um, um, uh, ZKM Karlsruhe, Turan and Albert Museum in London, and more. Uh, he was awarded with the Prix Net Art in late 2015. Um, and in this year's festival, he shows a work um, in the second floor, I think, in the group exhibition, Terms of Service, in which um, the Google homepage um, acts a bit like a mouse and reads the, the uh, terms of and conditions in Google, uh, of Google in Hebrew from beginning to an end. Um, so I think in, in his uh, in his uh, vocabulary, it would be a bit more like a documentation of a performance rather than a video work. Maybe you can talk about it. Um, so, I, I constantly ask me why did we all uh, um, connected us, and I think that that both of us uh, are starting a work within the engagement of a, with a, in a cor corporation or an institution or a, or a, la or a large system. Um, and going through your body of work, I thought a lot about uh, quantity and measurement. I remembered this ob obscure moment when I bumped into a generic YouTube video with zero cultural significance and I see, uh, I see that the I see the millions and hundreds of views of anonymous and generic crowd with no identification marks, and it leaves me with a sense of blindness. I also thought about uh, Marcel, Marcel Duchamp's classic work, Three Standard Stoppages. He called, it, he called it this work a joke about the meter. It was created in a time when consented European measurement, measurement uh, units, the metric system, was highly linked to modernity. A continental um, Convention from Napoleon Times. Um, so what Duchamp did is he made the work through the use of chance, dropping three threads, each one meter long, from height of one meter, onto three stretched canvases. He then adhered the threads uh, to the canvases, pre preserving the curve they had assumed upon landing. 
He cut the canvases along the threads, profiles, creating new units of measures, each in some sense a meter, uh, a meter long, yet it contained the element of randomity. So uh, from now on, uh, give, give constant the microphone. Sorry, I have a, a very minimal amount of Hebrew words. Constant de la Um You want to change the mic? I can also maybe hold yeah. it so it looks uh, like this. So I usually make the joke. <clears throat> I usually make the joke that constant de la means continuously boring art in English. But uh, so you have to have that uh, kind of sensibility in English, I guess. But uh, my parents were Dutch and they weren't aware of the fact that my name would be a joke. <laughs> uh, constant dull art is in all the time boring art. Um, but uh, I do think it uh, informed me in how I engage in my practice. Um, and first of all, I want to uh, thank Lior, but also uh, Prince Cream Festival and the Goat Institute for making it possible for me to be here. Um, it's wonderful to see the paradigm, the confusing paradigm of this country from the inside. Um, I won't ever attempt to say that I would understand even the minimum of it because that gets me into very strange conversations. Um, <laughs> but um, just as a, like, I would like to have like a very brief, quick introduction to my work. And uh, the first work that I wanted to start with was Jennifer in Paradise. And Jennifer in Paradise was the first image that was ever photoshopped. And the significance of Photoshop, we don't have to talk about that long, but of course the fact that you can manipulate the way that reality is documented was a kind of empowering tool. But it has very strange social implications where you know, it manipulates the way that we view the body, uh, the way that we view our own bodies, the documentation of our own bodies, and then I found out that the first image that was ever photoshopped, I found out that that was this image, and the first action that was performed with this image is that the, her body, the Jennifer, in the image was selected, copied, and cloned next to her, so her body was objectified. And I wrote a letter to her, what she thought about this. And I also thought it was interesting because this is an image that is very much between the authenticity of the photograph and kind of the manipulation of the photograph, right? Because this is still an analog picture that was digitized actually at Apple in 1987. And in 1988, it was distributed with very early copies of Photoshop to see and demo what was possible. But then the first instruction to do something with that image was to objectify the female body. So I thought that was kind of remarkable if you want to read kind of the culture that was distributed with this kind of software. So for me, this is that kind of the interest in like what is kind of implicitly packaged within these kind of tools, and like how we treat them, and how it influences our use of this tool too. But having read this letter and then publishing this image, I didn't own the image, right? So I just owned the way that it was read. And when it got attention, I got interested in the fact that I actually was manipulating the context in which that image existed, but previously it wasn't distributed, so it was just known as a kind of anecdote in Adobe's history. And um, the fact that I could then make it known that this story was out there, make this image significant, um, even start to be disconnected from me as in my practice, that after a while this became such a bigger, much bigger topic that it was irrelevant to, to still mention that I was an artist that actually brought this into light. And um, what I realized there is that it was very remarkable, or I thought it was very cool to actually author something, to author the context in which something was written instead of actually authoring an object or authoring kind of a specific commodity. So I, with this work, I cycled through a multitude of commodities, uh, which I always think is kind of funny to do. Uh, but in 2014, 13, there was more and more talk about like uh, validating an image also through a quantified number being the number of likes that you got on an image or on your work. So I would be in panel discussions, and then there would be other artists that would say, like, I got two million hits work or and uh, for example in articles there would be the amounts of uh, likes an image got 
or images got better distribution because of a certain amount of likes that it got, so it got higher in the algorithms. And I'm going to kind of bring it up that certain artists would start to think that was so significant that they would start to make work accordingly, so they would start to make work, so they, they would just get more likes, and they would just get more hits, right? So it's, and I still think it's tempting for everybody that's been using these kind of media to make an image in such a way that you would think it would gather more likes that you would get a little bit more social warmth from that little group. And I think these companies are making are evil because they're making money on our fear to be left alone. You know, we're just always, everybody's afraid to be left alone and you want to get this kind of significant feedback that you're not alone. So it's this kind of addiction run, which I think is, uh, you know, challenging like our way of like how we trade culture, let's say, but not even trading culture within the art world, but like also trading culture in our own intimate bureaucracies, our groups of friends, or the way that we, you know, deal with new cultures. And after a while I thought like, oh, you can buy these bolts, right? Like you can buy followers. You can buy artificial followers and make yourself seem more relevant. Just like I would buy new shoes and think like I look like a nicer person or I would lose some weight and I think I look like a nicer person and people would think or deem me in a different way. So I started to buy these followers and I started to look at them. And uh, so for example, this is uh, Gondar. And Gondar is a mechanical engineer, 29 years old. He graduated from ITM in 2007. So it might be that he tried to say that he graduated from MIT in 2007. Uh, but this, for example, was one of the techniques that these, you know, the, the authors of these bots would use, that they would take an existing bio and they would spin it. So they would just confuse a bunch of letters and then the original writer of that bio would not be able to trace it again. And then they would just add some other images. It's a way to automate content, right? To just spin the words, change the words, change verbs, or even change letters. This is one of my favorites, John Lan, and John Lan says, I'll prove to the world that I would e-come some hin in porons to the net someday. You know, it's like, it kind of speaks of ambition and frustration. I love so much Austin Eber. I think this person refers to Justin Bieber. But, you know, reveal some kind of impediment. Our opinion is irreverent. I don't know if irreverent, is that a word? I think it's important. And then I started to look at the images they posted, right? So this was still the time that uh, Instagram forced a square image. So they automatically cropped these, but I would still think that the faces are somewhat significant within the image. But then I would find these kind of strange images where they were cropped out. So especially if you, you know, have a, you know, kind of an intimate relationship to your army buddy, you know, why do you crop half the face off? Especially if you're reminiscing, hashtag reminisce. <laughs> or this, you know, the intimate moment of the kiss is definitely outside of the image. And this is, for example, a marathon. I was never aware that you could snowboard a marathon. <laughs> I think it's like the amount of time that you've been snowboarding, not the length of the actual track. And, um, and I would see these curators, but also other artists that have been you know, kind of validating their practice with the amounts of followers they have, their audience, you know, they could like show new works and they're te really tempted to use this commercial media, which I still think is kind of abusing our fear to be left alone. But they thought this was a relevant medium to kind of publish their artworks in. You know, they had these kind of public institutions and they didn't mind using a very commercial other platform. And then I saw that there was kind of competition between these curators and artists that were trying to adjust their work to become more relevant within these algorithms so they would pop up and they would be just more famous. And then, and then I thought like it's so, I don't know, it's kind of sad that they're struggling for these likes and at the same time you can buy them. So what happens if I just buy these people, the bots? So I, I gave this curator, Klaus Biesenbach, I gave him a bunch of bots so he would be at 100,000. Nice round, round number. And then I saw this aspiring artist, you know, like, didn't have that many likes, you know, like, only plus 11,000. Just starting out, only had five images on Instagram. You know, just needed this recognition, was urging for the same kind of relevance. So I thought, 
Should have been on the thousand tooths. You know, making equal, making the same. And then Jerry Saltz is a New York critic. You have to do the same, you know. Ai Weiwei, for example. Um, but what do you mean? Uh, how did you equalize them? Did you contact them and convince them they equalized them? Or one day they woke up with this amount of uh, followers? Like, what is the technical? I think that maybe um, the, the technical way that you work can um, help us uh, go deeper to, to your position as an artist. So uh, this took about three weeks, and about three weeks of every few minutes they would get 80 followers, because it's uh, impossible to instantly so get... So they didn't know? They, no, they didn't know. I, I mean, <laughs> their, their uh, profiles are open, you know, so I didn't feel like contacting them. I also, I mean, it's a mild critique, you know, it's a mild critique on their vanity. So, you know, why would I reveal to them that I'm going to critique them on this? So. Uh, but actually, I paid five thousand uh, dollars for two and a half million Instagram followers, and uh, it was done for a contact in Estonia. Congratulations! <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, anyway, so I will wait. You know, like, I will wait. Was also struggling for these likes, especially because he was publishing all these images from a country where Instagram wasn't even allowed. <laughs> Hansu with Oblis, you know, got very famous with like posting all these post-its, you know, everybody was envying him because he, like, so, see how close he got already to 100,000. I only had to give him like 1,901. So, um, Simon de Puy was an auctioneer. And I feel like you're about to I, I, I'm thinking about, uh, I'm thinking about, uh, Laurie Anderson in the 80s, she had, a, she had a performance, Home of the Brave, and it begins with a monologue. In the monologue, uh, uh, she speaks about uh, the zero and one in American culture and referring to the, to the language of the computer, the zero and one. And she says, maybe, um, like, and she says, what does it really matter? Maybe there's a little bit, like, it's, they are a bit, a bit too close. So I wonder, I wonder what, what does it actually mean by a journalist and I was very happy because it was the New York Times and I thought I was validated, you know, like I was about to go to a funeral and I thought I was all cheered up because the New York fucking Times was on the phone. <laughs> and then they, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> and, uh, and then they, um, uh, this person uh, asked about how many uh, artworks I had sold through Instagram and how much more money I had made through Instagram. And I was like, well, the work isn't about that. It's kind of a critique on this system and this competition-based system and like quantifying social capital. And it's so strange that if we quantify all the social capital, uh, it's harder for us to kind of uh, negotiate spaces outside of this quantification. So if we, for example, for example, kind of social uh, interactions where you would want to find, like a friend would tip you a restaurant, for example. Now you could also type it in on the map and see how many stars it got and how many reviews it has if it's actually popular. Or you give the amount of stars to a taxi driver that you used. Or you you know you 
gamify this whole system that in the end all these kind of intimate interactions that we would normally have to build a kind of culture and to potentially even start revolutions, these kind of interactions are now quantified in these kind of systems of based on competition, on, on like social competition. And I felt that was very uh, strange that this was embraced. So that, for me, felt like I was critiquing that by equalizing them to a certain number, and then later it was even interpreted that I was like the Lenin of social media because I injected artificial capital into you know, a social system. And of course, like the socialism within social media is kind of a nice pun. Um, but the article that was released by the New York Times, in the end, um, featured Simone de Brie and Ai Weiwei, who I uh, showed here before, with the amount of followers behind their name. So say Ai Weiwei, who has 120,000 followers. To be completely honest, the person in Estonia went a little bit over the top, so I couldn't <laughs> exactly stop at 100,000. So we stopped around 120, so everybody ended up with like around 120,000 followers. But I like the 100k because that was when it switched to a k. So it wasn't the actual number anymore, it was just like a general kind of approximation of like reach the relevance that was like now we're only thinking in the thousands, you know, not anymore about significant single people that don't matter anymore, we're just thinking of blocks of thousands. <coughs> and I thought like, I mean that moves up to a million. Or but then I thought like, uh, it's so strange that this system, like even New York Times when the journalist was aware that uh, these numbers were manipulated when I bought them, these followers, they still used the number to quote and to show uh, how important that person was on Instagram. And I thought it's so weird. I showed them that it's manipulated, it's hijacked, it's spoofed, it's fake, it's rigged, and still they print it. They still print as in this is true. So this belief, I thought this belief in this quantification of social capital is so much bigger than me with my silly, stupid little symbolic gestures can ever talk about. That I thought I should be more dramatic. And that's always, I think within my practice, I've always been struggling with being too dramatic. But I'm in therapy for that. <laughs> so it'll be fine. So I started a Facebook army. And I created 30,000 profiles on Facebook. And uh, I thought because of, you know, like buying these identities, the followers, the actions of these identities is one thing, but what if I author them, if I author my own audience, if I author my own context, if I author my own validation, you know, who needs real people? You know, in the end, politics found out that works the same way. <laughs> So are the followers still uh, still uh, there, or they after 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 they you've reached the amount they sort of like gave them back, or or also now their profiles are filled with like anonymous generic uh, profiles, fake followers. On the Instagram ones. If it's still if it's like if it's still there, or it's ended when you ended the work, and the followers are going back to their origins. Or it's still an I'm endless saying, performance. I understand the question. It was, it was, it, there's a t technical thing for this because there two weeks after my performance, there was a purge, yeah. so called purge, in which a lot of fake accounts were deleted. So, for example, Justin Bieber lost you know, millions of followers. <laughs> and I have to explain bots work in the way that they copy other people's behavior, dominant social behavior. So, they will look normal by just copying other humans' behavior. So they, these bots were just automatically starting to follow Justin Bieber. So it wasn't like he was purchasing millions of bots from so Anyway, but there were, we, they lost about half. So for example, I, like, I ended up like, I imp implicated myself also like making, critiquing my own vanity too. I, uh, so I gave, ended up with like 120,000 and in the end there were like 64,000 left or something. And I think a ton of them are still bots. Um, but there was an interesting moment when I reached out to the founders of Instagram um, to uh, see if I could give them the information so they could call the bot, they could delete them from my performance and they could actually also retrieve them from all the people that I implicated in this critique, but uh, they never answered. And uh, this was actually through one of their early uh, funders before they went public. 
um, and actually important things about public that actually their cash moment, their money moment when they were bought by these guys by Facebook. Um, so they weren't interested in discussing this. They weren't interested in retrieving them. So a lot of them are still around. Yeah. It's nice that people are uh, if uh, this, like the themes festival is between disappearance and appearance, and your action is uh, gaining appearance, where o when we, only when it's equalized, only when uh, you can say I've made this. Um, yeah, so the leftovers I think are, are, are a nice part of it. Mm -hmm. But this is especially with these kind of words that um, happen in a kind of space where uh, the. The performance also happened when these people were freaking out that they were getting 80 followers a minute. You know, there was like a gallerist there that really got freaked out because they couldn't see anymore which persons were potentially interested in the art to buy it. And they called Instagram to see if they could stop it and then realized it's impossible to call Instagram. So then they called this magazine, a magazine that was publishing about the work, and then they asked this magazine if they could stop it, and they called the institutions that I was dealing with. So it was kind of interesting in in that regard to see how, you know, that was a very intimate kind of experience on the, on the phone. Who, who uh, commissioned the, like, who uh, sponsored your action? Or, because I assume it's also like a, an art world uh, factor. Yeah, so this was the Jeux de Pont, uh, Museum of Photography in Paris, and uh, HMKV, the Hardware Medium Kunstverein in Dortmund. And you see it also as part of the content? That they yes, mm, yeah. Because I think I don't. I, Five thousand dollars is a lot, also for me. Uh, although I did pay my uh, uh, on my fee into it, and I actually went a little bit over budget for my own personal money because I wanted to reach two and a half million, not like two point one million. Yeah, I'm not asking, of course, because uh, of the money, but I'm asking because of like the mechanism of it. Yeah, no, I understand, but it's, uh, uh, I tried to reply with a joke because uh, uh, the, the mechanism is, it, of course, like implicit, but there's, uh, um, I do think that there's, uh, uh, I was mostly interested that it was Jeanne Palm commissioning me about photographic work, and then I chose this later as like part of the medium of photography, and that I thought that was mostly, uh, to me, was an interesting part of it. But, Perhaps I could continue with uh, my Facebook army because this is one of the profiles because I actually got the names of all the Hessian soldiers that fought in the American Revolution. So the Hessian mercenaries that were hired by the British to fight against the American independence uh, made money for the Landgraf of Hessen, Friedrich II, and Friedrich II with that money built the Friedrichianum, which was the first publicly accessible art museum in the world. Now, of course, the base around. Castle Documenta and like these places, but uh, these institutions. But uh, I thought it was fascinating that this kind of money from uh, Hessen also kind of came to me to do this commission, and then I could go to the university and find all these people that were fighting in the United States, in well, not then the United States, in the colonies in 1770 around that time, and they were uh, mercenaries, but they were these hired kind of soldiers. And I thought if I take these identities and then claim them again. And then the mechanics of that was that I sent a huge Excel list with all these thousands of names to a contact in Pakistan, who then coordinated between the Philippines and uh, Bangladesh and India uh, to buy phone numbers, and I would rent the proxies. So uh, I had thousands of internet connections at the same time, where we would connect the phone numbers and the SMS validation for these accounts and passwords and birth dates. They were all lazily born on the same day. Um, but, um, and I had them registered to be born in somewhere in Hessen, but then currently living somewhere in the United States. And uh, so the funny thing is that they started to register them also alphabetically. So, And they started to post these kind of uh, essays on identity, but they're in German, so they're difficult to read. And they would always post the kind of Hessian logo, like their shield, 
And uh, in the beginning, I told them like it has to be pictures of boys and they all need to be white because all these Hessian guys were white. Uh, but then in the end, I felt so weird going over Skype to talk to a contact in Pakistan to say that all these pictures need to be white, but I kind of dropped that. So it looks slightly different. But, and there's uh, Justin Bieber again. Yeah. He's a kind of, he's chasing me through all my work. Maybe I should deal with that somehow. Um, And then if you would follow them, your role would just be spammed with all these, you know, identity questions in German. But then you would also see your suggested contacts to the right. So a lot of people, I had them infiltrate different systems of, like, social systems of lawyers and artists and politicians. And then all these people would get these suggested friends, but they're kind of alphabetically sorted. So they freaked out because suddenly they had this whole kind of crazy boy army following them. <laughs> or, like, being suggested to them. Um, but I think for me, the big part of this was that I was making this in the end of 2015. So this was one year before the election that elected Donald Trump in the US. And I was warning about like how problematic this would be within the political system. And I think this is still a moment where I'm looping back to this uh, first image that I showed is that the story became almost the work. So the fact that the, I created this army, that wasn't the object anymore. It was me making a point that I could, for a limited amount of money, could just run an army and create content, create validation, and social validation, and meaning, and context around something. And I could just have an army at my fingertips. And I could do that from my home. And I think that this is something where I was so freaked out about that I contacted a bunch of uh, people and I formed a committee what to do with this army because the ethical implications were too large for me. Because if you would, for example, we thought at that time, what if we give these followers to Trump? And then later we say, oh, that's fake. That was a real question at the time. Now, of course, that seems remarkably irrelevant because that happened. But um, at the same time, we're also thinking, but what if we actually tried to support the cause? We would endorse, then somebody else could say that was faked. So there was like this double-edged sword or this catch-22 moment where we didn't know what to do and in the end I just, I chose to just kind of prove the point that this was possible. Right? I could just have these accounts. And if you, like, for, to answer the question where what happened now is that around 1% or like half of 1% is still alive. And I know that because people write me on their birthday and say your army is, has its birthday again. Because then there's reminders that something like a big group of people have their birthday at the same time. But I created a website and then when this got in the news after a while I released all the names and I released the data sheet that I got from the university. So in the end Facebook had all the names. And the only positive thing that happened is that I still have about I don't know, 10 or a dozen accounts in my name, but it's like not possible for me to do anything on Facebook anymore that has anything to do with my name. So I can't, like, as soon as somebody creates an account with something close to my name, it's banned. So I'm very happy with that. <laughs> um, and within this process, I'm just skipping through because then I think we can go to the actual conversation. Um, in the end, I found all these SIM cards, so the actual SIM cards that were used within this industry to make all these bots. So if you, like this is usually explained in a way that, you know, if you chart, if you make an account somewhere on social media, you get like a text message, right? Like a, some kind of verification card. So if you want to have 13,000 accounts, you need 13,000 SIM cards. So what's going to happen with the SIM cards after you use them? Especially because you keep them for a while, you put a number on it, that's maybe attached to the email. So for example, if they get blocked, you put the card in the phone again, and then you get the text message to unblock the account, and then it seems like you're human again. The only thing is that that's kind of expensive to do with like properly paid labor. So this is why it's happening in all these other countries where labor is, uh, let's say, more affordable and more problematic. And um, what I did is that I started to incorporate these in these works, where, for example, this is a work where it's actually a mirror. So if you photograph it, it 
very, it's very tempting to reveal you, so you see a little bit of the photographer in the picture. And what I did is that if they, if these people photograph it, um, and they use certain things that it's, um, let's say, noticeable by my algorithm, then they automatically get all these compliments. And these compliments, like, like the cropped jacket, or so hot, baby, or nice face, or never lose your awesomeness. <laughs> was also kind of interesting that these are these automatically <coughs> generated comments that are sold by these kind of companies as kind of a social fluff that is the completely uh, disconnected from the actual content of the image. It's just this kind of social reward system that's completely fake and like people make people feel good. And then I thought it was funny to kind of attach that to the work. Sadly, it's been purchased by an airline, and since then, it's hanging in a uh, flight lounge <laughs> of Delta Airlines. And uh, I'm very happy because uh, you know it paid itself back. But uh, it's bit, almost nobody takes a picture of it anymore. <laughs> it's kind of hidden. Anyway, but if you would find it and you photograph the work, you get a bunch of compliments <laughs> on, on your. Uh, Atlanta, I think. Um, America, of course, like it was, this is the American shields made by SIM cards from all these different countries that try to own that country. And for me, this is also still interesting because it's uh, the United States is the um, country that has the uh, most revenue per daily active user. So the revenue that Facebook makes on like all the different platforms is the biggest per user in the US. And I started to study this because it's uh, the different accounts. Um, so for example, an Indian account is much cheaper. Is let's say maybe five cents if you want to buy the full account, maybe 20 cents. If you want to buy a US based account, it's coming close to like maybe 50 bucks. So there's a huge difference that actually kind of copies the way that the world in the post-colonial system is organized, but these identities are crafted somewhere else. So I'm imagining this person in India crafting an American profile, copying the exact cultural attributes, knowing exactly what to do as an American profile, being able to sell that profile for 50 to 100 bucks if it's properly aged and seasoned, seasoned being like if there's content that seems reliable and believable. An age meaning that the account has been registered for a long time, so it's harder to delete. Um, that it's quite strange that they could sell this American profile for that much money, but they won't be able to sell their own profile for more than 20 cents. Uh, to me, this is this really weird, harsh reality and this kind of mirror of this kind of social media, which is still there. And which is not even, you're only participating in it if you would buy followers, you're participating in it if you're supporting this medium and this kind of social infrastructure. Um, and when I, when I made this Facebook army, it was so hard to decide what to do with that Facebook army that I, I didn't do anything. And later, of course, after these elections, you saw that there was so much propaganda and there was like Russian troll, troll farms and all these kind of stories came in the news, and I thought it was so weird that I made this whole Facebook arm of all these identities, and then I made a weapon, right? Like, and I never fired the weapon, I never did anything. So I symbolically created a weapon, and I left it there. And I felt very weird about that. Me personally, it's the opti optimistic part, like the, the no, really, because uh, there's something so uh, functional, and um, when you speak, I uh, with when I listen to you through through the through the talk, I I feel more and more um, the viscerality of what you do, um, because of the disfun dysfunctionality and it, and. I'm happy to hear in a way. I'm not, I'm not sure about when you raise it as a question, but there's something that encourages me that, uh, that museums uh, support such an um, action day that, that it's very, um, it has no presence. And then I wonder how do you deal with the space or how do you deal with the, 
when, when you need to exhibit it. Like when, where is the gravity center? Is the is the moment of exhibition for you? It's just um, something that attached to the gravity center, or it's something that has life for itself for you throughout your process. I think I see it as like a I don't know the word like metonymic narrative, as it's in I create this narrative and then my practice consists of references to that narrative. So then this the the SIM cards are, are a reference to that narrative. But for example, these SIM cards are also freaky because I bought these SIM cards, but I didn't buy only the SIM cards that were used in my army, but I bought them from the industry at large. So in the end, because it was impossible to discern which one was from uh, my army, so then in the end I sold it from, or I bought it from the people that initially bought all these SIM cards to get the gold out of the SIM card. So there's a minute value in like one SIM card, and if you have thousands of SIM cards, you could use a mechanical system to get the gold out, but it's very labor intensive and it's not going to be very rewarding. Most of the people speculate on fools buying this, trying to get the gold out, but not actually harvesting enough gold from these SIM cards. But then I managed to buy about like half a million SIM cards, which was interesting because I could pop them into a phone and I could get a phone number and I could find crazy Florida profiles. And this was a really weird system for me that I could actually find the evidence of this whole infrastructure that's being part of this social fluff and this kind of strange kind of ghosts that are hovering around us and are validating certain political or social infrastructure principles. And to me, this is, you know, like the, the Facebook army was one the story or one thing that after a while I don't even I proved the point that it was real and after a while like I don't even need it to be real anymore. You know what I mean? Like it's it's something which is now proven to be real in so many different aspects that my symbolic gesture to do so initially has been outnumbered by the actual relevance of these things having turned against us. Um, but I felt guilty, I felt weird that I never shot this weapon. Like I felt like I had to, I, had, I should have done it. You know, not like as a kind of seeking power, but I should have done it, I should have proved the point. And I should have proved the point, and especially within the art context, which is such a symbolic, weird, small bubble, I felt like I should have done it. So after a while, this overlap between these kind of public-private spaces was still of interest to me, and then I found, for example, the this is the Instagram profile of the Department of Homeland Security in the US. And I think it's obscene that they have an Instagram profile. They're seeking social validation while they're actually a government system. And they need to find, like, use this uh, kind of commercial platform to kind of make them be more likable, you know, have more followers. So what I did is that I, because I made friends uh, building my army, I'm using the armies of other friends now to distribute my poems. And if you see the poems here in the comments, or the actual the comments, but if you read them line by line, it reveals my poem, but as uh, read by all these anonymous people. So it says, to know one's way around, protecting highways between safe and sound, so within the expanding fences you can stay, Ascending on the versities decay, extrapolating the farcical innate, confining the stagnant within the conservative state, exercising the arrogance of constitutional belonging, enforcing entitlement with a sediment sting, bought from employees without a dime to learn, whose identities local legality will not discern, hired by people with money to discreetly burn. Oh, sorry, that went a bit too fast. I go. <laughs> There's another one. There's another one coming up. So, what I try to do here is um, is see if I could reclaim this kind of public space, this kind of reclaim this territory of propaganda in a kind of smaller, more intimate style where I could have my own poem read by people that, you know, in this case it was all Southern, like South American profiles responding to, in this case also Customs Border Patrol. Um, so these kind of systems that are very clearly uh, protecting borders or, or protecting a kind of identity of the United States. Uh, and I had these South American profiles uh, speak on their images. And this is also funny because it's, 
I'm, I'm like I can read this to you now, but like nobody will have seen the image by themselves, you know. And the only person that I think directly read the poem was the person, the social media intern, you know. And they were in the bathroom with the iPhone that this Instagram account was connected to, and they suddenly got this huge poem in order. Um, Let's see if I can read this one. I think I'm searching for the image. It's recording. Yeah. Marking down a deeper line during distributed mind and dime. Drawn in fresh thought, common sand, dividing our diligently crafted land. Forced dogma shapes community. Perspective access sets us free. See more longings than demands to exchange keys or shake some hands. Come in hot and cross the pledge. Not a border, but a feathered edge. Proprietary technology left ajar. Limits play viewed from afar. Borders aligned with luxury. Ease this quantified reality. Beyond the limits we try to see. Travel beyond what is sold as free. Automated spirits venture more. You stay inside and feel hard. Culture is defined by wealth, not preference. Knowledge does not pass this gilded fence. Learn to dogma shapes community. Perspective access sets us free. Symbolic walls need to move. Social agencies should improve. Present in discourse and debate. No cohesion to censor and frustrate. Borders align with luxury. Is this quantified reality? Children born of those who stole have their given wealth to control. The others who were stolen from, born each generation like just begun. Dogma shapes community, perspective access sets me free. Compliments by hired others from lands with lower wages imitate the in intimate who engages to the local life it smothers. Borders align with luxury, erase this constructed reality. Social here is made there, affordable manufactured care. Hold over symbolic lines, knowledge access declines. Don't believe the fakeness hype, reality is just someone's gripe. Borders align aggressively, celebrate others' poverty. We belong to everywhere. Within us, we find ransomware, being part of everything, and learn how any bird can sing. Borders align with luxury, erase this constructive reality. Borders align aggressively, celebrate others' poverty. Borders align with luxury, dogma shapes community. Borders align aggressively, perspective access sets me free. Erase this constructive reality, celebrate others' poverty. Distribution thresholds lend a hand to limit the forgotten state of being part of one whole to favor prime location control. Perspective access sets me free, erase this constructed reality, stop celebrating others' poverty. Shipping water bottles to your peers who already who are already drowning in their fears. Sourcing dependency to gain reward so your wealth is safely stored. The longed for by those in debt in their dying beds remain inept. Perspective access sets me free, erase this constructive reality, stop celebrating others' poverty. Anyway, and then these comments are not part of my mind. These are other people that <laughs> Anyway, thanks for your patience, by the way, for letting me read this in that poem in a slow, kind of droning way. But the poems are also written as like this kind of uh, cadence and this kind of clear rhyme. And then this is actually showing all the people that have been speaking my poems. So you see, you know, which people have been my hired hands. Pretty pretty people. Where are you?
Well, this is actually funny because it's a lot of Brazilian profiles in this case. And uh, the Brazilian profiles are often um, stealth profiles, which actually means that uh, these people have, you know, sometimes there's websites that would uh, give you followers for free, uh, but you just have to give them your password. And that means that uh, then they can use your account for things like uh, this. Like, uh, so anyway, I did another one for the European Council also. They're collected on a website called attention.rip. Uh, rest in peace, attention. And then we're looped. This was the uh, brief introduction. Okay, it's time for a Q&A. Maybe someone has a... We have uh, about 10 minutes left. And does anyone from the audience have a question? One. One question? Okay. But sometimes it takes a takes few. Okay. Okay. No questions? No. Of course, one question. Yes. So you said uh, $5,000 went into buying followers for these particular people. but. But not all the five thousand dollars was your own money. You got money commissioned from public uh, institutes. So now they actually own followers. Like if they commission a drawing, they would own the drawing. Like they commissioned an artwork. So they they commission you to buy followers. They own followers. No, but uh, as in like the commission that didn't work like that. Like the commission doesn't mean that they own it. Immediately, like it's an art institution. Like if they commission a work, it doesn't automatically mean they own it. Like uh, it could still be a work that is, uh, it's really still could be fine. Mm -hmm. Like it's not. Uh, uh, anyway, that wasn't specified. But I understand the reasoning. But like normally it would be like commissioned, and then I would like if I would, they commission a, a mural or something, then they would have that mural or painting. But in this case, it was that was different. At the time that they gave this commission, they knew that this money would go towards buying followers? At that time, they were confused. <laughs> you know, I think it's still, like, still, if I'm talking about these things today, for a lot of people are like, what, so you're doing, you're hacking somebody's phone? You're in my phone right now? Like, people are generally still very confused with what it means to get an SMS that would verify a system and, like, how, it, like, how the whole infrastructure works. And I think this is a conversation we had earlier also that actually the work that I'm showing in the exhibition is a work from 2012 where I was much more in my techno nanny phase where I'm like explaining people that it's you know, the dangers of kind of infrastructures. And this is, I enjoyed the fact that there was kind of a miscommunication about like what was exactly happening. I remember when I got the commission, I was sending a, a selfie that Klaus uh, Biesenbach and Hans Ulrich Oblist and Marina Abramovich made of themselves and posted on Instagram. And the exhibition was themed clowns. And then I sent that picture, and they, were, and they said, like, no, 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 it's supposed to be about clowns. And I said, like, yes, I know. This is why I sent the picture. So there was some kind of strange uh, miscommunication about that, which I actually really, I also really enjoyed. I think they didn't really meet, know the fact that it would be executed in that way, but in the end, they were quite happy that it, it, it was successful, like a lot of people were talking about it. Maybe follow so, up. Yeah. Inside job, they got an inside job. Basically. But that's not a problem. No, I think it's. I mean, I don't. No, I don't see it as a as a negative thing. But I think it's part of the mechanism. Um, I think it's actually po a positive thing. I think it's like you know, like a, like a Kobe, uh, does a painting of his uh, of his um, sponsor. Yeah. It's like. You um, approach it like you uh, yes. you refer to that too. Uh, it's part. It's part of. It's part. I think it's. I think it's stronger actually. I, th I don't. I don't say it as a as a negative thing. It's, I think it's actually makes it more po poetic uh, rather than it would be your money or a money you have. Uh, I don't know. Uh, made a Kickstarter or something. Well, can I, well, actually, to be honest, like, a, a, I thought it was very nice to, it was so, uh, it was so exciting to do in secret, also, honestly, 
that I was very happy to, so the budget was 4,000 and I, I made it like including my own fee and I put like 1,000 in my own money because I wanted to have the spectrum be larger. So I did lose some money on it, but I still think the story is really nice. Maybe, maybe a follow-up. I think, I think, I think I understand where you were going with your question. Uh, in, in a way, if you sell, um, if you sell your work, if you, if you sell your followers or the followers that you've hired, you're injecting them with more value than they didn't have before. So in a way, you can repeat that, that mechanism again because you are an artist as well and you've created it within, a, within an artist company. Is that something that you've played with? Um, yeah, I did implicate myself, so I was part of the selection of people that, was, that got the followers because I wanted to not be clear that it was me and I wanted to also criticize my own vanity in this regard. But it was, of course, very strange that people afterwards said, like, hey, you're, uh, you just uh, participated in this whole uh, protocol that you are criticizing. You are actually uh, collaborating, right? So I've always sold this to myself as participatory anthropology, as in, like, I needed to understand how this whole system works so I could, I, I knew how the mechanism works so I could, like, criticize it from the inside. And actually, it was quite, the Facebook army especially, it was quite interesting that I was invited into several kind of think tanks to explain them how this mechanism worked because a lot of these agencies studied the mechanism of making uh, troll armies, but they studied it from outside. So they would say like, that's a, that's like a, whatever, Iranian army, or that's like a pro-Hillary bots, or this is like a Trump bots or something. But they only studied it from abroad, and I could show them like, you have this amount of money and then you just do it on your own and then you run it. And then the simplicity of like how that was run was really interesting because people didn't have dare to actually start to do it themselves just to study it. So I think this for me is like a kind of nice uh, order to rely on. And on the other hand, if I, the value that is created through these bots is interesting, but I still, the, work, the way that this work exists now is purely by reference. So for example, I use the bots and I make banners with uh, flags and we have parades with uh, <laughs> like these kind of crazy things. But then there's, uh, it's not like, I wouldn't sell access to the followers. Like this has just been one action that they've done as a performative thing. And then the work, the rest of the work exists in reference to that. So you wouldn't sell me one of your followers? <laughs> no, you can buy a banner of it that refers to it. <laughs> That's a sign that uh, we have to end because our time is up. Sorry. There is a there is a next and even just as exciting, if not more, <laughs> continuation uh, with Adam Harvey and the Atsega in just three minutes. So thank you.